Hi everyone, long time no see, uh, and I just want to preface this video with uh, a statement that I understand what happened, or at least, uh, you know, sort of the gist of what happened with uh, ContraPoints uh, and Twitter, right? You know, she kind of put her foot wrong uh, with some people in the trans community, the people who seem to have uh, control of the transgender narrative at the moment, uh, and... Um, you know, rumor has it she was bullied off of Twitter by people who were taking objection to things that she had said about non-binary people and uh, what those of us who are not concerned about offending trans people uh, would would call trans trenders. So um, I, I thought about uh, lightening up a little on her with this. Uh, I don't think I'm going to. I think I'm going to stick with... Um, what I originally had to say and uh, and the original tone uh, which most of this script was written um, long before that happened so I think I will uh, I will just continue as I am I think that uh, the response is merited so here goes hi boys it's me again just your average girl. Look, I may be a biological female, but I do hope that just for this video, we're able to converse as men. I want you to think back to 2016, which I know in internet years is like halfway between now and the decline of Rome. Do you like history, boys? How did Rome fall again? Was it the gays? No, it was the feminism. Wouldn't you know it, giving women equal political rights and social status tends to collapse civilizations? The rampant homosexuality of the Roman Empire just prior to the fall was not a cause. It was simply a knock-on effect of Rome's liberated women being such intolerable cunts that men were forced to seek a pussy substitute. Lacking internet porn, sex dolls, and VR, they were somewhat limited in their options. You know what they say, any port in a storm, honey. Even if you need to give a reach around to be invited back. Too edgy? Not historically accurate? Who cares, as long as the production values are high? Oh, if only I had your wardrobe and set pieces, then I'd really be credible. Tell me all about it. Back in 2016, the big internet culture war was between feminists on one side and men's rights activists on the other. Whatever happened to that? These days it's as dead a meme as, I don't know, Harambe. Sure, because the feminists have pretty much changed tactics from engaging in pitched online battle to identifying and blocking all the men's rights activists from their various social media accounts. This sometimes happens in the space of two or three tweets that challenge a feminist's assertion. And uh, even occasionally over the dire crime of liking the wrong tweet. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Personally, I dream of the day that feminists are so confined to their echo chambers they might as well all be living in a commune on the island of Elba. I did want to do the fedora, though. Every YouTuber who's ever covered the men's rights movement has done the fedora, and I wanted to put my own little twist on it. My wardrobe notes for this video say, MRA femme fatale and fedora, but make it fashion. School shooter realness. I feel like I'm also serving a little, oh, red-pilled Carmen San Diego. Which raises an intriguing question. Where in the world, or more precisely, in what reality are you living? But leave it to you to have wardrobe notes for a video allegedly focused on ideas. Stunning and brave. In this video, I want to ask, in all seriousness, what are we going to do about men? In all seriousness, Fedoras aside, you certainly seem to be taking the topic very, very seriously. I mean, I get that this whole gothic Victorian costumey ostrich plumey thing is your shtick, but I'm dubious as to whether you'll put substance over style. I mean, what is this to you? An excuse to dress up, ham to the cam, and then absorb the adulations of your fans? Because, no offense, but as a group, you guys kind of seem like you're not doing okay. Nice of you to notice. Can't wait for you to blame it all on the victim. Could a group of people who are purchasing uncooked alpha yogurt possibly be subsisting in a state of psychological balance? Fellas, are regular bowel movements gay? I guess, yeah, kind of. 
You don't see a whole lot of psyllium husk in heterosexual medicine cabinets. So, uh, probiotic yogurt is marketed to maintain uh, women's digestive health, right? You know, you can't watch daytime TV without being bombarded with ads for Activia and other an unpasteurized yogurts marketed at women to promote a healthy gut biome and fecal regularity. Are you shaming men now for eating alpha uncooked power yogurt? You know, to keep their guts healthy, to keep themselves regular, get a bit of extra protein, have a healthy balanced diet, and if alpha chad males are eating that crap, doesn't that mean they actually care about their health, including their poops? Because I can't imagine any other reason to eat yogurt. Ugh. I'm losing my target audience here. I don't think you are. I think your target audience is eating this up even though we're just a couple of minutes in and you've already managed to contradict yourself, belittle the people you claim to be concerned about, and pander to the idiots who lap your shit up because however vacuous it is, it's delivered with flair. Listen, my dudes, let's just say I'm kind of worried about you guys. And I'm not saying I'm any better. To be clear, I'm not okay either. There's like 15 jars of urine in my refrigerator right now. Yeah, that's right. Women pee too, okay? Get over it. I had no idea that women pee too. I personally never had. And yes, you're not okay. I'm so sorry if this offends your male notions of feminine delicacy, but I, for one, will not be shamed by your patriarchal bullshit. What you appear to be doing here is confessing to your audience that you're mentally ill. If there's anything I'm 100% confident of, is that we as a society should be taking advice from people who store their pee in jars in the refrigerator. Then again, where else are you going to store them? You boys, you're very rational, aren't you? Ugh, I suppose I was too. I admit that these days, rationality, it's something I struggle with, both as a biological female and as a Pisces moon. But when I decided I wanted to make a video for men, contrapoints, for <laughs> I started brushing up on my reasoning skills because I want to be so fucking rational for you. So to prepare for this video, I read Newton's Principia Mathematica, Wittgenstein's Tractatus Logico Philosophicus, and of course, the philosophical classic, The Rational Male by Royal Caliente. So my mind is well lubricated and I'm ready for what I have no doubt will be a penetrating intellectual interchange. I know that when I want to connect with an audience in order to express concern for them, the first thing I do is mock and ridicule them, and the second thing I do is portray them as intellectually inferior to me. Look, I want to play by your rules, okay? So there will be no emotions in this video. Oh, and essentially describe the stereotype as the blanket reality. No emotions? Really? After watching a few of your videos, I have to conclude that you mask your true emotions behind humor, sarcasm, and dismissiveness. Unless, of course, there's actually nothing deeper to you than the snarky face you show the world, which would be sad. How depressing. No matter how much lipstick you put on, you still can't manage to achieve the emotional intelligence of a woman. Or a man. I will present my arguments in strict, logical form, relying only on facts, reason, evidence, and deductive proof. And costumes, props, jump cuts, diverting asides, superficial charm, lingerie, and rhetorical sleight of hand. But do go on. Actually, you know what? Fuck that. Let's listen to house music and do sex drugs. That would probably be more productive and enjoyable than listening to your opinions. I'm pandering to the male gaze. Oh, and the male straights. No, Natalie. Pretty sure that's just your own narcissism. Or maybe this, and all your other eccentricities like the elaborate set dressings and campy costumes, the snark, the various puns, double entendres, silliness, and witticisms, is just a means to ex obscure your actual thesis. Wouldn't want the listeners to spend too much time thinking about what you're actually saying. If so, 
It's more creative than the lightning-fast jump cuts other SJWs use to rush the audience on to the next dubious assertion before they've had time to absorb, let alone question the last one. So yeah, kudos for originality, I guess. Not that we know whether there's even a thesis buried in this video as yet. God, I love attention. Hey, Gorge. Hey, Gorge. Hey, Gorge. Okay, I'm ready. Let's crack open a cold one, boys. My hands are too pretty to open the can. I need a man to do it for me. Help. Fuck it. Ooh. Okay, that's super fucking pretty. Hey, Gorge. Hey, Gorge. Are there any women still watching this video? I'm really sorry about all this, unless you're into that sort of thing. If this was a video of you pulling your best attempt at an otolisk without ever opening your mouth, yes, I would be into that sort of thing. From a purely aesthetic point of view. Gorge. In which case, how very dare. I'm a good Presbyterian. And by Presbyterian, I do mean pansexual. Hey, how are y'all? Look, the video is about men, so I'm trying to be attractive to men. Why is that necessary? First off, the value of your opinion is not contingent on your level of attractiveness. A multitude of studies have replicated what we all learned from Ripley, Vasquez, G.I. Jane, and dozens of other female characters popular with men. It's when a, when a woman downplays her femininity that men start taking her ideas and competencies more seriously. What do you want to be known for, Natalie? Your intellect or your underpants? Or is the sex bomb thing, again, a way to distract the men watching from thinking too carefully about what I hope you're going to be telling them about themselves and their circumstances? Anyway, here's hoping there is a thesis here for me to unpack. If not, other than fat material, this video is just a waste of everyone's time. <sighs> Am I doing this right? Is this what men like? Trap. Strap. It is a risky look for a girl like me. When you do a lingerie look, you know you're gonna wind up somewhere on the Frankenfurter Violet Tchotchke Dita Von Tees spectrum. Oh, but you don't know where exactly, and that is a dangerous game, ladies. I have to say though, I actually am feeling pretty fucking empowered right now, but um, that could be because of the drugs. Nope. It's because you're leveraging feminine sexual power over your intended male audience. Those who find your coquettish slash vamp routine sexy will watch and no matter what, they'll like whatever nonsense comes out of your mouth. Look, gentlemen, let's be rational and we're fooling around, okay? Part one. Oh wait, rational. I know you poo-pooed this whole thing earlier, but I'm gonna say it right here. Men are more rational in general than women. This is not because women are incapable of rationality, but because they are more emotionally sensitive and less emotion emotionally stable. This is at least in part a function of biology. Just ask your teammate, Theron. When she first went on estrogen, she'd start bawling at things that wouldn't have even phased her before. She might not have even noticed them. A change that did not take place during months of presenting as female, but immediately upon taking cross-sex hormones. Meanwhile, biological females transitioning hormonally to men report that even when the situation merits crying, it just doesn't happen. Research shows that when the emotional domains of your brain are engaged, the parts responsible for logical thinking are inhibited. For women, hashtag not all, the emotional domains are dominant. You can't think rationally when you're in the grip of your emotions. That's just a fact. Axiom one, America's next top victim. I think there is some truth to the idea that we live in a victimhood culture. You think? What gave it away? The progressive stack, Black Lives Matter, the fact that when you explain to certain people that women on the whole do not get paid 20% less than men for the exact same work, they don't say, well, now that I see the evidence, that's quite the relief. But instead call you a rude name and block you on Twitter. Victimhood is currency, Natalie. Would that it weren't so. Victimhood should be something ameliorated when possible, not worshipped and guarded like a holy relic. And I'm not just talking about campus SJWs with their microaggressions. No, bitch. This goes all the way to the top. We have white people complaining about reverse racism. We have the literal 1% complaining about anti-rich prejudice. You do realize that anti-rich pre prejudice 
led to the deaths of hundreds of thousands of kulaks and millions of ordinary peasants in the subsequent famine caused by the liquidation of a class of people who were considered too successful. Hate, resentment, and prejudice can occur along any axis, Natalie. So can the violence that those things are often used to justify. Eat the rich, yo! The wealthy are openly hated by many, as are whites, as are men. This is culturally permissible because as a group they are perceived to have more power and to be the progenitors of injustice. Genocides all begin with a victimhood narrative where the targeted group is portrayed as being privileged above others or as having unjustly taken something away from the group doing the targeting. I'm certainly not defending the system of corporatism that allows a handful of multi-billionaires, you know, who like you, Natalie Wynn, uh, to wield more influence than the entire rest of the electorate. But let's not deny that the wealthy are openly detested and that this form of class hatred is seen as not just permissible, but just. Or that this hate is based on envy, that the rich have something we also want but do not have. Right? It's not that we hate them because they have something bad, it's that they have something that we want for ourselves. Or that if you were born into wealth, you'd likely be a champagne socialist like all the others, condemning poverty and xenophobia from your 16-bedroom mansion, none of whose rooms are available to house homeless Syrian refugees. That must be super fucking hard for you. We have the heterosexual agenda organizing straight pride parades, you know, flaunting their sexuality in the faces of children who are trying to raise a family and protesting in the street like a bunch of I'm almost positive that the straight pride parade is a form of in real life shitposting, Natalie. When 90% of the multi-billion dollar corporations in the US, all of them headed by those terrible, horrible, no good, really bad rich people, mind you, rainbowify their corporate logos for an entire month to proclaim how much they love the gays and other assorted alphabetisms that should signal to all of us that we've mostly reached the point where pride parades are no longer necessary. I will grant you that trans issues remain a significant social concern. Maybe we should just have trans pride parades you could attend in your underpants and all would be right with the world and so of course because there was women's rights there has to be men's rights too actually no that's not why the reason why there has to be men's rights is because certain rights others are entitled to are either not granted to men at all or are regularly infringed by law and policy and yes some of those issues have been caused or exacerbated by feminism, which is not synonymous with women's rights, bitch. But a lot of them did not originate with feminism. Male-only military conscription is a men's rights issue because in most countries, only men are forced to serve during a draft, and in the vast majority, with mandatory service, even in peacetime, it's also male-only. Interestingly, did you know that in South Korea... Men have to serve for 22 months after turning 18. They're paid less than minimum wage. Meanwhile, their sisters go straight from high school to university. Until recently, men had been able to leverage their service as partial credit in university programs they entered two years later than their sisters did after serving their country for a pittance. But women's rights groups insisted this gave men an unfair advantage over women. So now, they're not allowed to do that anymore. On the other side of the planet, in Sweden, affirmative action in university admittance was repealed the moment men began to benefit from it in university in general, where women are 60% of students, and in particular in fields like veterinary men medicine, which is dominated by women to the tune of about 90%. This after an outcry from women's rights groups that declared it unfair Unfair that less qualified men were being given the same advantage women had been given for decades. The minister responsible in a statement said the, that affirmative action laws were instantiated to help women, not slam the doors of opportunity in their faces. And in the U.S., well, male dominance in post-secondary was considered a massive problem in the 60s and 70s, and corrective action was taken. What most people don't know is that up until the 1940s, 
there wasn't much of a gap at all. The gap between men and women in post-secondary was a direct result of the GI Bill, which gave veterans, many of whom had been drafted against their will, grants, low-income loans to purchase houses and start businesses or to get an education. Oh, what a strange, strange world we're living in, that a token of appreciation from a government given to the men who were subjected to an involuntary servitude on its behalf could be so convincingly reframed as an unfair male privilege that oppresses and marginalizes women. I've been hearing about men's rights for my whole adult life, and I've always been very skeptical. Because in my experience, online men's rights activism in practice always looks like this. Women try to do a good thing to solve a real problem, and then a man shows up to say, well, what about men? A real problem for both sexes that is being portrayed as a gendered problem targeting women specifically? When the claim is women are oppressed because online harassment, then... Why wouldn't some men acquainted with the statistics come in and say, actually, that's just a people problem, not a women problem. You ever wonder how effective a treatment is going to be if the diagnosis is wrong? If the goal is to create an environment where women don't feel afraid to express their opinions online, how effective is it telling them, falsely no less, that they suffer harassment online for just being women? How is the the internet hates women with opinions narrative helping women when the reality is that the internet hates anybody with opinions pretty much equally or or when the reality is that, is that the internet hates men with opinions more than their female counterparts which it does just fyi Men also get harassed. Why aren't you talking about men? And is this man actually involved in activism to stop harassment against men? Of course he's fucking not. He doesn't give a shit. He's a troll. His contribution to the conversation begins and ends with what about men? Sure. And your contribution to the conversation begins and ends with who cares? You're killing my women are victims buzz here. Don't you have anything better to do than to cramp my style with your facts and shit? What about them, honey? For this video, I decided to actually do some research for once, and the first thing I did was read the foundational text of the modern men's rights movement, which is The Myth of Male Power by Warren Farrell. Actually, I listened to the audiobook because, uh, let's be honest, reading is hard. But as I was listening, I admit I thought it made more sense than I was expecting it to. Basically, Farrell says that second wave feminists rightly fought against the traditional gender role that confined women to domestic servitude. That role only ever existed for about a hundred years, and even then only for the upper 40 to 60 percent of society. While mothers were attached to their children in ways men were not, most notably through pregnancy, confinement, and breastfeeding, the vast majority of men and women through history, whether serfs or tradesmen, operated their businesses out of their homes. The primary difference between men and women was not that men were less obligated to a role defined by domestic servitude, since the domicile was the headquarters of the business and the family was the primary economic unit. It was that men, and not women, were also obligated to a role defined by economic and military servitude to those above them. That is, taxation and conscription. Betty Friedan's problem that has no name was not the female traditional gender role. It was boredom. In fact, Emmeline Pankhurst argued that women should have the vote in order to gain the political power to free themselves from the drudgery of paid work. And freed they were, not so much by political enfranchisement, but by the effort and sacrifice of men who formed the front lines of movements demanding better wages and working conditions and a bigger piece of the pie, often in the face of corrupt police and hired thugs who had carte blanche to beat and intimidate them. And then less than a hundred years later, Pankhurst's feminist philosophical descendants were arguing that women required to be emancipated from their emancipation from the drudgery of paid work. Why? Because the privilege of not having to work is a form of oppression, at least when it happens to women. What an interesting conundrum. Women's rights has been a project to free women from the obligation to work outside the home and from the obligation to work inside the home. Whatever the condition women might find themselves in, the working mother chained to a loom or the stay-at-home mother chained to a baby, it's oppressive and it's men's fault. That damn patriarchy. It's not that women are fickle. 
It's that the horrible, oppressive patriarchy refuses to keep up with women's completely contradictory and ever-changing demands. But he argues that the feminist idea that men have all the power in society is actually an illusion because the traditional gender role for men is just as oppressive. No, I don't think that's what he's arguing. He's arguing that women have power over men. Think about it, Natalie. Why do you feel empowered while lounging in your underwear, pandering to the male gaze? You think maybe it's because feminine sexuality is a form of power? He's arguing that men do what they do because it's what women want from them. He introduces the idea of male disposability, basically the idea that society values female lives more than male lives, which are seen as expendable in the service of protecting and providing for women and children. And he points to statistics showing that men make up the majority of military casualties, workplace fatalities, murder victims, suicides, and so on. So we're supposed to conclude that even though at first it looks like men have more power than women, in fact, the queens have a certain kind of privilege in being protected and provided for by the expendable male worker bees. And I guess that kind of makes sense. I feel like I can at least empathize with the point of view. What I'm saying is, I took the red pill and I rubbed it on my club. Oh god. This is a function of biological imperatives and sex differences in reproductive costs, benefits, and risks. Sperm is cheap and plentiful, ova are scarce, and both require the expensive real estate of the uterus to do what they're designed to do. Some great ape cultures are so defined by male disposability that 95% of males are excluded from the mating pool. They're not expected to die for the good of the group, though they risk dying if they don't do what is expected of them, which is to go away upon adulthood and never come back. In others where males are allowed to remain, oh, about 80% will never sire offspring. They're disposable in the reproductive sense, and we, individually and collectively, are the product of those who passed on their genes. When the future is female t-shirts inspired by a woman who endorsed a program of eugenics to cull the male population to 10% of all humans are available for purchase and worn in public, I'm sorry! I have to wonder just how much we value men and male life! But some initial objections come to mind. Like, haven't men been almost all of the kings, presidents, and CEOs for millennia? Didn't men make up all these rules in the first place? I don't know, boys. Still seems kind of patriarchal to me. Sure. Men's rights activists aren't going to tell you that the people who held the most formal power historically weren't men. We might tell you that the people who made all the rules historically were not comprised only of men, and certainly did not encompass all men. And we might tell you that the fundamental disagreement MRAs have with feminists is what we believe is their misattribution of intention, cause, and effect. Let me give you an example. Marriage in Christendom. A patriarchal institution, if ever there was one, enforced by a patriarchal religion that assigns primacy to the male, both in terms of God himself, himself, not herself, and his first human creation, Adam. A lot of feminists moan about how misogynistic the injunction that women obey their husbands is, but they conveniently miss the verse just a little ways down that men love their wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her sake. What do you think that means? That means men were being told by this patriarchal religion that their role within marriage was to die, if necessary, for the sake of their wives. So being a husband wasn't all about enforcing male power over women. How could a man reasonably be, in, be expected to stand between his wife and the dangers of the world, whatever their source? If she had no obligation to duck when he said duck, run when he said run, be silent when he said be silent, and obey the rules he set for everyone in the household so he wouldn't find himself prosecuted or executed in their stead. I mean, keep in mind, the time period we're talking about here, Rates of honor-based killings and of legally sanctioned executions were appalling. And no, honor-based killing is not just killing of women. 
If a husband could be held socially or criminally accountable for his wife's misdeeds, it's hard to argue that this situation didn't put her in a position of incredible power to put him at risk of death based on her behavior alone. I mean, let me put it this way. The president's security detail has one job. Keep him safe. They're expected to die, if necessary, in the service of providing that safety. And you know how that works? He has to obey their instructions. If it's not fly safe to fly to a memorial service, he doesn't get to overrule his security team or the flight crew. If he's told by his Secret Service detail to leave a function early and by the back door, oh yeah, you better believe he's expected to obey. And if he disobeys their instructions, he not only puts them at enormous and unnecessary risk, he makes their job of protecting him impossible. Now, who has more power in this relationship? The President of the United States or his bodyguard? Who is privileged by their role in this contract? The biblical edict that women obey their husbands only privileged men insofar as when you demand a carpenter drive nails, you allow him the privilege of owning a hammer. That some carpenters might have used their hammers in, in ways that we don't approve of or do harmful effect is not a refutation of the purpose of hammers or the reason we gave them to the carpenters in the first place. And I'm not even finished with marriage either, because regardless of the rules of marriage in whatever culture, in my opinion, feminists have misattributed the, its primary function. Many second waivers in particular describe marriage as an institution designed for the purpose of subordinating women's reproductive potential and domestic labor for the benefit of men. It makes women the slaves of men. And I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But I'm just not getting that. Right? I just, I, you can't. It's sticking in my throat because you know what? The primary function of marriage was an inst as an institution was to hold men accountable for the products of their sexuality, the children that they sire, and to obligate them to their partners in the reproductive endeavor. And you know how I know this? Because the moment the culture threw marriage down the garbage chute via no-fault divorce and destigmatized de female promiscuity, it created massive, ruthless, punitive, bureaucratic, and legal institutions to continue to hold men accountable for the products of their sexuality and obligate them to their partners in the reproductive endeavor. We threw away women's obligations first. And we threw away marriage, and yet men are still obligated. The man's role in the marital contract is the only one we still care to enforce, and we will enforce it even when there was no marriage in the first place. We liberated women from their historical marital and reproductive obligations to men. She need not obey him, cook or clean for him, provide him a sex life, or allow him to see his children. But in this same time period, we have actually expanded the ways that we continue to hold men to their end of the age-old bargain. Which came first, male privilege or male responsibility? And finally... The causal relationships feminists espouse that gender roles are a product of patriarchy, they have the causality exactly backwards. Patriarchies are an emergent property of biologically imposed reproductive roles and potentials within certain environments. They are stable, functional, and productive to the point that they are the sole model by which societies become civilizations. Without patriarchy, nothing visible on screen in your video would exist, and no one outside of that room, if the room itself even existed, would have any way to look at you lounging there in your underpants. Camille Paglia once famously said that if civilization had been left in female hands, we'd all be living in grass huts. I view that as optimistic. The foundations of patriarchy, male-male cooperation, father investment, egalitarian monogamy, and gender division of labor were laid long before an innovation as technologically advanced as a grass hut was a twinkle in anyone's eye. Look to the bonobos if you want to see the results of a matriarchal trajectory. Ten to twenty thousand individuals who survive only because of human protection and who will be dead the mo or assimilated the moment the Congo dries up or their northern neighbors, common chimpanzees, ever learn to swim. At which point... I will suggest to feminists determined to dismantle the patriarchy. Be careful what you wish for. Anyhow, I think I'm done for today. 
Uh, I don't know if you could tell, but I was getting a little bit angry there. I don't want to have an aneurysm or something. Um, but I will continue uh, picking apart this video. Um, I'm hoping it will get meatier further on. Um, I'm hoping that there actually will be a thesis buried somewhere in this steaming pile of ostrich plumes. But um, we'll see. And uh, I guess I will see you all next time.